The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. When the people saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into boats and they crossed to Capernaum to look for Jesus. When they found him on the other side, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered, I tell you now, you are not looking for me because you have seen the signs, but because you had all the bread you wanted to eat. Do not work for food that cannot last, but work for food that endures to eternal life. The kind of food the Son of Man is offering you. For on him the Father, God himself, has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do if we are to do the works that God wants? Jesus gave them this answer. This is working for God. You must believe in the one he has sent. So they said, what sign will you give to show us that we should believe in you? What work will you do? Our fathers had manna to eat in the desert, as scripture says. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus answered, I tell you now, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven. It is my father who gives you the bread from heaven, the true bread. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us that bread always. Jesus answered, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. The Gospel of the Lord. Many years ago, back in my youth, there was a popular song, and for some reason I remember it. It appeared in 1970 and was sung by a country and western singer called Lynn Anderson. I won't sing it for you, but its opening line was, I beg your pardon, I never promised you a rose garden. Some of you may remember it. Now, whatever about Lynn Anderson way back in 1970, it's the kind of song that God could well have sung faced with the whinging of the chosen people out in the wilderness beyond the Red Sea. Because here they are whinging about not having enough bread and enough meat, starving to death in the desert, dreaming of Egypt where they say we had at least pans of meat and had plenty of bread, even if we were slaves, we could get a feed. But you see, here is a people who have twice been liberated by God in the most extraordinary way. The God who forces the hand of Pharaoh, who says, let them go. And once they've gone from the land of their slavery, they find themselves caught between the devil and the deep red sea. And again, they look like goners. They're finished with Pharaoh's army charging after them and the sea before them. But then, then a God, again, God intervenes to liberate them. The waters open, they go through, and Pharaoh and his army are drowned, we are told. So twice this God has liberated the people in the most remarkable way. But having got to the other side of the Red Sea, on the road to freedom, 
the whinging starts, whinging in the wilderness. We want to go back to Egypt. And it's precisely at that point that God might have sung or said, I beg your pardon, I never promised you a rose garden beyond the Red Sea, but I did promise you a freedom of which you could scarcely dream. You see, they want God to deliver the goods out in the desert to give them pans of meat and plenty of bread and leeks and cucumbers, all the good stuff they had back in Egypt. They want a God who delivers the goods, the cargo. And what God delivers is freedom. Insofar as they're caught in that world of false expectation, they conform perfectly to what St Paul says, living an aimless kind of life, wandering rather than journeying, caught in the world of the old self, as St Paul says, a world of illusory desires that dreams only of pans of meat, plenty of bread and leeks and cucumbers by the Nile. What they are in need of, according to St Paul, is a spiritual revolution that gives birth to a new self that understands that God may not deliver as we expect or want or even demand, but God delivers in other astonishing ways, things far deeper, things eternal in fact, the freedom that is ultimately in Jesus Christ. But the first step out of the old world and its illusory desires, the first step on the way to that spiritual revolution, we are told, is a kind of curiosity. When they see this delicate, powdery, fine thing on the ground like frost, they look at it and they say in Hebrew, Mana, what's that? That's what the word manna means, what's that? So there's the curiosity, which is the first timid step out of the old world with its illusory desires, because God gives them bread in the desert, but it's not the bread that they expected. And insofar as they are imprisoned in their old expectations, they'll starve to death. So what's that? is the curiosity, the voice of curiosity, that at least is that first timid step out of the old world. But the breakthrough, according to Jesus, comes once we find our way from curiosity, what's that, to belief. He could hardly say it more clearly. The people ask Jesus, what must we do if we do the works of God? Jesus' answer, this is working for God. You must believe in the one that he sent. So it's the encounter with Christ and our belief in him, putting our trust in him, that really does lead us into the freedom that God delivers. But you see, the people who meet Jesus in the gospel story, they also, like the whingers in the wilderness, they want Jesus to deliver the goods. Jesus says, I tell you, you're not looking for me because you've seen signs or because you have put your faith in me, no, but because you had all the bread you wanted to eat. They saw in Jesus someone who could deliver all the bread they wanted to eat. Again, like the whingers in the wilderness dreaming of pans of meat and loaves of bread. And that's, they think, that's what Jesus delivers. By contrast, Jesus says, I don't just deliver the goods, I deliver myself. I am the bread. This is extraordinary language. But it's the truth that Jesus speaks to us this morning. 
I myself am the bread. God delivers Jesus to the world in all our deserts. Jesus delivers himself as the bread which is our life. It's a bit like the good news. Jesus doesn't just deliver the good news, Jesus is, <clears throat> is the good news. The good news is not some message that he passes on and then walks away. The good news is Jesus himself crucified and risen. So just as he says, I am the bread, he also says, I am the good news. That there is teeming life out there in all the deserts of the world. There is a feast that God prepares even in the desert. Christianity then is the grandest personality cult that the world has ever seen. It's all about the person of Jesus Christ. Not once upon a time, but here and now, as the good news and as the bread that God provides for all our hungers. That's why we speak of encountering Christ, that is Christianity, to encounter him, not just to hear some abstract message or philosophy of life, but to encounter him who is present and here is power. So we use the language of seeing him, hearing him, knowing him more and more deeply, loving him more and more deeply, becoming like Jesus and actually becoming Christ in the more radical language of St. Paul. We use all of that language because it's all about him. I beg your pardon, I never promised you a rose garden here and now, is what Jesus says to us this morning in our lockdown. But what he does promise is a royal road of freedom, strange but wonderful, and in the end it is the road home, not to some rose garden whose flowers fade, but home at last to the garden of God's ecstasy, which is our true home and where the great feast will be set. Amen.